just to make sure I got a digital lead out here. Looks fine. Okay. Cooperative Legacy Project interview number 43, June 29th, 2006. We're visiting with former Grand Electric and West River Cooperative Telephone Manager uh, and South Dakota Co-op Hall of Fame member, Daryl Henderson. Daryl, where and when were you born? I was born uh, right here in Hedinger, North Dakota, where same town I presently live in, in uh, September of 1938. Okay. And what was your father's name? Father's name was Kenneth Henderson. Okay. And he uh, farmed and ranched uh, at Lodgepole, South Dakota, which is a small rural community 15 miles south of here. Okay. And you want to talk about him a little bit? Well, uh, he was one of those individuals that was in the early days of uh, Rural Electric. Uh, remember when I was a kid, probably in 10, 12 years old, when uh, Rural Electricity finally came to our area and, and uh, the place uh, had to be rewired and we were finally able to, to uh, do away, at least after some safety period, do away with the uh, big old batteries and the uh, wind charger that we had for power uh, and he believed in those type of progressive advancements he was not a person that was very inclined to serve on on uh, those type of boards he was kind of a private individual that liked to take care of his place and uh, and and uh, while he while he was very supportive of of cooperatives uh, Senexes and the and the farmers the farmers union the Senex and the Grand Electrics and those things in the world he was not overly active in them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What was your mother's name? Emma. And you want to say a few words about? Yeah, her? she. Uh, what was her maiden name? Her her maiden name was Ingalls, uh, mm-hmm. and she had come out to this country from the Selby area as a school teacher and, and met my father who'd been here he was here as a young man had been born and raised here on on a, a homestead that his his parents mm-hmm. had and she came out here in uh, 19 I think 28 or in that area and then they married in 1929 and she just uh, didn't teach very long she was busy raising a family and and she was a uh, a homemaker always put a lot of emphasis on uh, reading education things of that nature uh, kids were expected to do well in in school and if you're expected to do well in school you usually do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're both passed on now he he died in uh, 1988 and she died in 1993 both here in Hedinger they lived their entire lives in, in uh, married life here in this community in almost 60 years and uh, are gone now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did they kind of commute down to the, the ranch? No, they lived on the ranch, oh, uh, on the ranch. until uh, until they had retired. I actually bought the ranch from my dad, the family ranch from my dad in 1973. Uh, Prior to that time, I had been working for the Boeing Company on the West Coast, and actually some of the locations at the Boeing Company where I worked were associated with uh, field engineering and was, I was assigned air bases and things of that nature but uh, I bought the place from in 73 they continued to live on it for a number of years after that and as the, as their health began to fail then they moved here to Hedinger mm-hmm. and, and uh, uh, lived here the remainder of their life okay where were, where were the, your, was your family originally from as we go back to European or <coughs> Well, it's, it's quite, there's quite a mixture. Mm-hmm. Uh, more, most immediately, my uh, my grandfather was from Wisconsin, and my grandmother came from Groton, South Dakota. And there's some uh, Scandinavian and some German and and some Scotch Irish, um, all in the background. Mm-hmm. 
I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure exactly. Well, you go back far enough. I think some of the Hendersons, the name Hendersons, some of those came from England mm-hmm. back further. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, brothers and sisters. Yeah, I I had uh, my siblings are all deceased at the mm-hmm. at the present time. I I'm the youngest of the family. I had uh, an older brother, Dennis. Yeah. Uh, Two older sisters, Janice and Karen, and they are all all now deceased. Mm-hmm. What are you, you have some or, or early memories from life out on the ranch? Well, you know, I I always I always loved life on the ranch. Uh, <clears throat> I particularly particularly liked the livestock end of the ranch. And and we didn't farm very much. We were pretty much livestock oriented. Uh, always had horses, and uh, the <clears throat> we used in in the livestock end of it. And I remember when I <clears throat> went to high school. I went to high school here in Hedinger, and I uh, boarded with my grandparents, who at at that time had moved to town, much like my parents did as they got older. They'd moved to town. I boarded with them, and and. Uh, because everybody boarded then. It was only 15 miles, but nobody drove back and forth on an everyday basis. <clears throat> and, and usually I couldn't wait to uh, be home on Saturday because no matter what time of year it was, there was something that was going on on the ranch that I liked. And, and I spent my summers working on the ranch and spent my weekends working on the ranch. And, and then after I uh, graduated from college at the South Dakota School of Mines in 1968, we... I worked in engineering for 13 years before I came back. And I, the thing that I missed in this part of the country was the, was the people, not so much the country. We lived in some really nice areas like Seattle at times and mm-hmm. other nice areas, but I did I did miss the uh, Midwestern people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When, when you were young, what did you want to do? Did you, you, were, you were enjoying the ranch out there, but... Uh... You know, what did you think about doing? Did you think about doing that, or did you think about something else? <clears throat> I th- I think uh, as I got you know in high school, I probably thought about something in the technical area, and that's why I went to an engineering mm-hmm. school. You like science <clears throat> and math. I, I like the science and math and things of that nature, mm-hmm. but I can't really say that I ever liked anything better than than ranching. Probably, mm-hmm. you know, ba- in the back of my mind. I, I always liked the ranch, and when I had an opportunity and my dad was 65 to come back, then I was interested in coming back to this country. Mm-hmm. You talked about your dad's uh, feelings about uh, getting electricity and so on. You remember when electricity arrived on, on the farm? It, was it, you, you, had, you, you mentioned batteries. Did uh, you have electric lights previous to that? Well, for a period of time before that, we had a wind charger. Tower, and we had a set of the big. Uh, I think they were either 24 or 32 volt batteries in the basement. I can't. I think they were uh, 24, probably. Uh, the big batteries that were probably a foot and a half by three foot long, and uh, and, and you had electricity as long to some degree. DC. Mm-hmm. Electricity. As long as you had wind and the batteries were charged up, mm-hmm. uh, you used them pretty sparingly. And you used them primarily only for lights. Mm-hmm. Very little else. Mm-hmm. Um, did you listen to radio? Did you say oh, yeah. that for radio? Oh, yeah. Sure you did. You, you always, everybody listened to radio. But, uh, uh, but in, those, in those days, it wasn't the great, you know, great conveniences. It was not. They are now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what happened at your place when you got electricity out there and you had more power than the, those batteries could provide? What uh, sort of things did... Uh, did you start getting? Well, one of the things that that changed people's way of life was uh, the conveniences it provided within a house. For uh, a, a lot of times, the the work of the housewife was simplified almost, and you know, and you then had electric motors for elevators uh, and, and things of that nature, and you had. The possibility to have welders and a lot of things uh, like that, uh, you know, it's an almost endless list of uh, new appliances that came about for household use. Mm-hmm. And you know, you had 
unlimited amount of power for things like TVs and radios and mm -hmm. as they became available. Yeah, and probably seldom did the the person who was having their home wired realize how much wiring they were going to ultimately <laughs> need. Yeah, you know, I remember when our when our house was first wired, and I, I was, I'm, I'm not sure if it was, uh, I think it was about 1949 when when Grand Electric's, that section of Grand Electric was activated. <clears throat> I might be wrong on that year, but it's, it was about then. And I was about 11 years old, and uh, I do remember uh, that crew being there, and it was it was a big event, you know, when we finally were able to turn the switch and and have decent lights in the house and and things of that nature. Uh, something that people were really anxious for and really waiting. And you know, they'd all paid their, I think, five dollar membership fee per person, which it doesn't sound like very much, but at that time, I guess it was it was more uh, in, in terms of. That five dollars then meant more to them, of course, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. than it does to us now. Yep. And uh, they were signing up. Mm -hmm. The other day, uh, one of the guys I interviewed had a copy of the 1957 Central Exchange catalog, and you could buy a new cockshit combine for $5,800. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Tom, values have changed. I got a note. You didn't remember things about your dad at all. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, the other things, and she was just reminding me, you know. Something you should have said. Well, during the 30s, when there really, farming was uh, pretty pretty bad, and everybody dried out, and they didn't, I, he did, he worked. Uh, on the WPA projects, the CCC projects, or whatever you call them, WPA projects. He was foreman of, of one of the crews that built one of the local dams and, yeah. and things of that nature that are scattered all over the country to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he also ran a coal mine. Coal um, mine. A coal mine, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, uh, <coughs> there are some hills, and there's, there's, these hills are <clears throat> on our, still on our, our family ranch, which my son is on at the present time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they mined coal uh, for local sale, you know. And I don't know if it was the best coal, but it was it was coal. Mm -hmm. uh, had a tunnel. He had a tunnel mine, and 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 then there were also mines during that period of time that were at I guess at the very worst part of the depression, which I don't remember because I was born in '38. There were there were actually free mines mm -hmm. that he used to uh, tell me about. In fact, he showed me where they were. And they were more or less open mines where they took coal out of the vein right on a hillside. Mm -hmm. And it was about half coal and half dirt, I think. But people could actually come yeah, with their wagons and load their own. And it was a very poor quality coal. But if, you know, it was available, and I think a lot of people probably took advantage of it because there simply wasn't any money. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always remember an interesting story my dad told me when they sold the last of their livestock in, uh, I assume it was probably around 35 or 6, mm -hmm. the, very, the very worst, there was nothing to feed them, and they'd started selling livestock, and they lost, you know, didn't have any hay, didn't have any grass, and, and they finally, he, he told me, he said, you know, we sold the best, our best of our livestock at the end, saved the best of their livestock, and we sold that for the least amount of money. And when he sold the last of the livestock, he came back. And the story he told me anyway, and he had uh, sold, and I don't know what it was, how many cows or what he had sold or what, but he had $80 in cash, and it was the money he'd gotten from selling the remainder of his livestock. Had it in his billfold. He decided he should go out and close up the pasture gates and f where they'd moved the cattle out of and... He went out and closed gates and came back in the house, and his billfold was missing. He lost it. So he retraced his steps, and he went out, and it, he said, it was the only money I had in the world uh, to feed my family. And he didn't have really any job at that point in time. And, but he went out uh, to one of those gates where he'd gotten out of a vehicle, and there laid his billfold. And... Uh, 
He said he didn't. He said I never did know what I was would have done if I'd lost that eighty dollars. It was between me and starvation. <laughs> There were a lot of grasshoppers around here, too, as some people have told me. Yeah, I think they were. You know, most of that was... Um, earlier on? Was earlier than me, but I remember them talking about mm -hmm. how, the, the, you know, the grasshoppers would just kind of almost fly in, in clouds mm -hmm. and uh, devour anything that had any hint of green in it. Yeah. You know, uh, I've seen, you know, some fairly bad grasshopper infestations, but nothing like that. Nothing nothing at all like that. They seem to thrive very dry. Here. Yeah, they seem to, and there's always, when there's not very much vegetation, they just, I think they just uh, strip what there is, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. how, how long was it before your dad was able to reacquire livestock? <clears throat> well, I think... It was only a matter of uh, probably a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the in the forties, uh, the early forties, uh, and even in the very late thirties, mm -hmm. when they began to, to get some moisture again in this yeah. country, and the country greened up, and uh, grass began to grow again, and most people got back into livestock business. Mm -hmm. At one time before the before the uh, he sold out, he had they had he and his father. That family had had run cattle and sheep, and then when they sold everything and reacquired livestock, they just went in the cattle business. They never mm -hmm. they never were in the sheep again. I, uh, yeah. uh, so the uh, I probably was around the t around nineteen forty. Yeah, was there any wheat production around here in those days? Uh, I know my, there, my dad used to tell about the, uh, also in the 30s when they did get a crop, they had rust and yeah. pretty well wiped it out. You know, and I and I remember in uh, in the I suppose it's probably the late 40s we we had that same. There was some wheat production here in the 40s, uh, and I remember particularly one year when the, when you mentioned rust, we had uh, a flat of wheat that. Mm -hmm. Uh, looked awfully good, and ended up weighing about forty-five pounds yeah. a bushel. Uh, yeah. The rust, the rust of that time, mm -hmm. uh, almost destroyed the wheat crops. Yeah. People come in from the field. Yeah, and they were just you covered just covered the cover the rust. We also had, you know, in in some of the, some of the later years, we had rusts on some of the grains. I remember in the uh, probably in the seventies, I I had my teenage son was out. Cutting grain, cutting oats with a open cab swather that we had mm -hmm. at the time, and he came in and he couldn't hardly breathe, and he was, uh, we, had, he stayed out there till his eyes were just about shut, and he was rust from top to bottom, and you know, and he didn't really realize that it was that bad out there because he was cutting and mm -hmm. uh, had to get him. <laughs> I think we had to get him out of there. Did you when when you went to school? Did you come straight into, or did, was there a country school? We went. I went to country school up through the eighth grade. Okay. And there was there was a country school that was less than a mile from where, right. from Lodgepole. What, what was the name of that? It was Lodgepole. Lodgepole School. Lodgepole School. Okay. Yeah, we uh, had a little. Uh, oh, you know, I suppose it varied in size, from probably twelve to, eighteen kids over the years. There was usually around fifteen kids. In that neighborhood, at least, and there were probably it was you know the same one teacher taught all eight grades or whatever grades there were. There occasionally be a grade there was nobody in, but usually there were a couple kids in each grade, a couple three kids in each grade, or one or two. Uh, we when the weather was good, we rode horseback to school, and to the dismay of our parents, we raced our horses after school. Uh, you know, like kids will do, uh, and took our lathered horses home and. They knew exactly what we'd been doing, but we thought we were fooling them, so it was all right. Yeah, and there was a, there was a, there was a country creamery uh, called Lodgepole Creamery, uh, about a quarter of a mile from our place. It was between our place and Lodgepole, and our ranch is only about three quarters of a mile from from Lodgepole. And uh, they had a the family that operated that had a son and my age and he and he and I were kind of uh, the same age and 
went to school those years together and, until they moved away. And then when the creamery closed, they, they moved to uh, another another town, I think, in Trip, South Dakota, uh, okay. where there still were creameries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the high school here in uh, uh, Right. I, I started high school here, well, I graduated in 56, so I guess I would have started in... Uh, in the fall of 52. Like I said before, I boarded in town uh, at my grandparents and uh, went home on weekends. Mm -hmm. Get any, uh, do you remember any blizzards and so on that came, would come through this country? Oh, uh, well, yeah, you know, it, it seems like then our. And we haven't had much for winters recently, but it seemed like every winter then you had uh, some severe blizzards. I, I remember in grade school. Well, when your brother came home. Yeah. Was. Well, in, yeah, and I, that was in 1950, I think, in the winter of 50. When he, my brother, my older brother was in the service, when he came home, and, and I think he, he he had been in boot camp and he had a furlough over Christmas. Um, he had to walk in the last half mile from the main highway. The roads weren't even open. Uh, the, we had had a blizzard, a huge amount of big drifts. I walked out the highway and anxious to see him and, and walked in with him and drug one of his bags across the snow banks. And, and he carried the other one. We uh, that year we went to school a lot of the year in bobsled, in about with a team of horses in bobsled, and that's one of the things I re remember about those winters is uh, how hard uh, people worked to feed a relatively small herd of cattle, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know they uh, they dug hay out of stacks with pitchforks, hauled it on bobsled hay racks and. It was an all-day job to haul a couple loads of hay to cattle and a lot of back-breaking labor. And people didn't have a huge number of cattle. They simply didn't have the, uh, the machinery to take care of them, I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now uh, loaders are so good and everybody puts up um, lots of hay with round balers and things of this nature. Everything's mechanized. Mm -hmm. Ranches, and that's one of the reasons that ranches... Besides the economic reason, that's one of the reasons ranchers have gotten bigger. They have the equipment to be bigger. Sure. Uh, economically, they have to be bigger to survive, it seems like. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's nobody anymore that milks uh, a cow and has chickens and two or three hogs yeah. that I know of. No, 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 it's, a, it's an entirely different era. If it's, if it's happening, it's not happening in South Dakota. No, it's, it's happening someplace else in the world. Dakota, yeah. Um, so then you, uh, you uh, graduated in 1956, uh, right. you, you, you go straight to... Yep, I, the, went, uh, I went right to, uh, in the fall of 56, I went to the South Dakota School of Mines, and uh, went to school there, I graduated from there in 1960, mm -hmm. with a degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, my first job then was with a company called North American Aviation in Los Angeles. I worked for them for uh, part of a year and... Was that a big transition from Lebanon? Uh, yeah, it was... From Hedinger <laughs> and uh, Rapid City to Los Angeles? Yeah, you know, uh, it was even a big transition from Hedinger to Rapid City, yeah. and Rapid City wasn't all that big no. then, no. but it was a fairly big transition, but uh, it was a huge transition, of course. Uh, Jan and I were married in 1960 after I graduated and we went to Los Angeles and then that was a huge transition because you know we didn't know anybody out there and there were millions of people and uh, uh, mm -hmm. where did you live out there? Well we lived in in, Ingl in a suburb called Inglewood first in an apartment and then we later on rented a house and lived in Hawthorne but the North American Aviation Aircraft or North American Aviation Company had uh, acquired some fairly large defense contracts, and those they lost. Uh, it was one of those programs where the funding was cut back and they lost them. And anybody that had been there uh, less than a year 
on those programs was automatically laid off, and including me. And at that time, I went to work for the Boeing Company in Seattle. Glad to have a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I would. And I, I worked for Boeing from 61 until 73 when I came back uh, and bought my dad's ranch, bought my family ranch. Mm -hmm. and they had some layoffs somewhere in there. Didn't oh, they? yeah. They, Boeing had a, a lot of layoffs my brother over the years. And, uh, yeah. You know, uh, the d defense industry, in, in, uh, which most people in those companies were working in, was kind of boom and bust. You know, they'd get defense contracts and they would hire lots of people and then um, some of those contracts would disappear and, and, or get completed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was always a, I, and I don't have any idea anymore, but the, the, it seemed like Boeing was going from a maximum of about 100,000 employees nationwide down to about 60,000 and they'd go through that every four or five years. And, and then they'd be getting contracts, and they'd build back up. And um, I never was, uh, I never was caught in any of that. I mean, I was in an area where we, our portion of the business was pretty secure. Uh, but I, I wasn't. Seattle was much nicer than Los Angeles as far as, as far as living conditions, or we thought it was. But I was anxious to. Uh, get back someplace in the Midwest. And I had the opportunity with Boeing to uh, do some work in what they called their f field service engineering. And that actually, were, we were support people to the Air Force at Air Force bases. So when, when we delivered a weapon system to the Air Force, Boeing kept a number of people there during the delivery process and then as support people after the process. And I worked in that for almost that part of Boeing for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, I, you know, there were a couple times that I was back in Seattle for short periods of time for between assignments and things mm -hmm. of this nature. Now, what but, sort of places did you end up going to? Well, I uh, was at uh, Maelstrom Air Force Base in Great Falls, Montana, mm -hmm. and some of the areas we lived in there included Lewistown and Great Falls, and Conrad also in Montana. I was at uh, Minot Air Force Base mm -hmm. in North Dakota, and I was at Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota. I was at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri, and I uh, s spent a period of time at uh, Rap City Air Force Base, uh, Ellsworth in Rap mm -hmm. City. And a period of time at a facility the Boeing had service people at called Plant 77 in uh, Utah, out between Salt Lake City and Roy, Utah. And that actually is the facility where the uh, Minuteman missile was assembled and tested. And I was assigned to that program. I was there about a year. So uh, usually our assignments were in the nature of... Uh, Plus or minus a little bit of time, close to a year. Might be at an air base and then we'd move and be at another mm -hmm. air base. Mm -hmm. The last one I was at before I came back to the ranch was Ellsworth Air Force Base. And of course that was kind of convenient because it was close. Yeah, yeah. So what was uh, in your mind when you decided to get back to ranching? Oh, I, I uh, you know, I'm... Was your dad's health a factor? No, really wasn't. He, although he was, he he was, he was retirement yeah. age. He was he was sixty five and I'd always talked about and he and I had talked a little at times about you know I'd like to be back in this country ranching. Mm -hmm. So when he was getting ready to turn sixty five, he actually told me he said you know I'm ready to retire and and if you are interested in in coming back, this is when we should do it. And uh, that, so we came back in uh, 1973, and then we've been in this country ever since. Uh, I was on the ranch from 73 till about 83 or 4, before I, before I took the manager's job at Grand Electric and Western Telephone. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, I was there at Bison until... Uh, 2001 
in that same job. And in 2001, I retired mm -hmm. and moved back up here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were certainly some ups and downs in, in, in ranching, mostly based on both prices and, uh, uh, and uh, moisture, a lot yeah. of water. We, you know, there were some, uh, yeah, there really were. There were some. Did you ever have to get rid of your foundation herd, or are you always able? To you know, I was always able to hold on to the foundation, uh, uh, hold on to the foundation herd. Although uh, there were times when I reduced the number of cattle mm -hmm. significantly. We had some years in there that were that were very dry. Yeah. In the early eighties, eighty, I think eighty and eighty one in particular, I can remember that it was kind of like. Uh, the portion of the state, as you talked about earlier, where things didn't hardly green up. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on that year, we got some moisture, but things there were some bleak times. The hardest thing about the 80s, in a sense, um, was that even though there were times when the prices were fairly good, it was, it was a highly inflationary period. Interest rates were very high. And anybody borrowing money to operate, like, uh, like I was doing uh, as a young rancher, um, it was it, that was one of the more difficult things. Was interest rates were high. Um, when you had uh, decent cattle prices, and you, you, for example, you thought you should be able to get ahead, it seemed like that interest was was eating you up. Mm -hmm. Land prices elevate too. Around well, they have they over have they have story. over the years. You know, there really hasn't been. Um, a lot of land for sale. Any, yeah. You know, the, the, the most, in all of the recent years, it seems like people have been inclined to retain their land in a family and lease it out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of the places now are larger because they lease land. I mean, there, there are instances where they bought some land. Yeah. But, but uh, there's, there probably is a lot more leasing. And, and frequently... Uh, a neighbor's place is leased out to two or three other neighbors. Mm -hmm. You might split it, or uh, geographically, say maybe sometimes half it's on one side of the road and half it's on the other side of the road, or it fits two or two or three people's places. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, people do are doing a lot more of that than they were used to. Those places are still there, but there's either just a couple living there maybe working in town or they're retired and maybe moved off the place now. Yeah, yeah that's the case with our place in North Dakota. Yeah. Uh, what part of North Dakota is that? North, uh, northwest to Grand Forks. Uh, north we were in the middle of the Minuteman Missile Wing. Oh, you were? Yeah, we had, I was out and helped move grain out of the way at harvest time when they were trenching across our, from our <laughs> fields. Uh, you were elected to the Grand Electric Board in 1974. Yeah, when I came back here, I, uh, my father-in-law uh, asked me, you know, if I would be interested in serving, and I, uh, on the grand board, and I, I, you know, he said there's probably not much chance that you would get elected uh, because you're running against an incumbent, and I thought, well, you know, it wasn't something I had really thought a lot about, frankly, and I was pretty busy at that point in time uh, trying to get the to get everything done on the ranch, but I had agreed to run, and it turned out that I won that election, uh, and then I served on that board for a number of years, I've, and it was, that was my, uh, the first time I met John Reedy, mm -hmm. uh, and John was president of that board, and he was, uh, he was a pretty strong influence. Uh, I, I know on my feelings towards cooperatives, and I think on a, probably a lot of the other board members as well, you find those uh, rare individuals that are strong leaders, and John was that. And John would tell you in no uncertain terms what he thought, uh, which, and, and he always thought almost first about the co-ops. Mm -hmm. And that was his, that was his, uh, I, I think more, he had a fairly large family, and I think most of the time these boys did the farming and the ranching, and uh, I'm not that John didn't work on the farm and ranch, but he put a lot of energy into the local co-ops. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was that was kind of a, uh, that whole process of serving on that board for those 10 years. I think until I, until I applied, when I applied for the manager job, uh, I resigned from the board, of course. Mm -hmm. But, uh, 
was a learning experience where I learned a lot from some of the veteran board members, and in particular, John. He said, John set a high standard for what he thought co-ops should be for their members. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, if nothing else, you know, by osmosis, you pick up a lot of that stuff. He had also served briefly, at least, in the yep. legislature. Yeah, and he'd served in the legislature. Uh, well, in, both it, in the territorial legislature, right. wasn't he? Yeah, and, and the, the first, the first uh, Co-op Hall of Fame annual banquet I went to was the year that John got elected. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't really remember what year it was without going back and, and looking at the South Dakota Co-op Hall of Fame mm -hmm. uh, website. It's on there, uh, mm -hmm. but it probably was around uh, the late 70s or 19... 80s in, the, well, in that area. Mid 80s, I would think. Maybe it was mid, maybe it was mid 80s. First one was in 85. Okay. We yeah. just barely got Emo Lorex that year. Yeah. He died in the fall after being inducted. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I, I always I felt in, in my co op philosophy, which I, I think I developed a lot from the mentoring of John Reedy. Mm hmm. Um, you know, John. John was like those early co-op leaders. Uh, the member was the reason for the co-op, and if you weren't serving the member by what you were doing, you probably shouldn't be doing it. You know, and if you served the member and you served him in, a, in as most efficient way you could, and it was a needed service, and, and that was ingrained. I think in that grand board, and John wasn't the only uh, early board member. There were several others. It's just that at that time he was the president, and he was kind of the spokesman of, of those early board members. And I had I had the the privilege, I think, when I look back at it in particular, over the years, the, that board had not changed much. They had many of the original, almost original members on it, and it was it was the point in time when they were starting to get off boards and disappear. And I served with several of those early board members that had been on almost since the beginning. Uh, it was it was really uh, when you look back at it, it was really kind of a uh, an opportunity that you didn't even realize you had, but to pick up a lot of that early philosophy on. And then as it went along, you know, the transition was was very gradual, uh, maybe a board member and maybe a couple of years from now another board member, and, and they were that age. And, and over the years, they, there were always, the years I was on the board and, if, and even the years then that I managed, there was almost always a nucleus of experienced board members that set the standard for the new board members. You know, um, it was an almost ideal situation. And then, of course, I was also managing West River Telephone. And, and that co-op had been started really by Grand. But uh, the Grand board decided, you know, we really don't have the, the, uh, the time to undertake this project. So then West River uh, formed, their own, formed their own separate company and, and had their own board of directors. So all the years that I managed, I actually reported to two boards. Mm -hmm. We we operated the two companies jointly. We used the same office help, uh, the same facilities. We had separate outside people because it didn't work very well to try to train linemen to be telephone repairmen and vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, we always had two boards. We had, you always knew you had two board meetings every month, you knew you had two budgets, uh, and you just kind of had to switch hats, mm -hmm. uh, which kept the job very busy and very, and, and very interesting. You know, there's always, uh, and you know, and during the period of time, telephone became much, much more demanding than it was in the early days when when the telephone technologies began to change and there was deregulation and mm -hmm. a lot of things happened and uh, we were almost on a monthly basis trying to search for for what we should do in the mm -hmm. telephone industry. Well, in that period of time, the electric industry was, was older and was more stable. 
Yeah. Uh, we always always said uh, we were kind of fortunate <coughs> because if we had a if we had a major construction project in the summertime of one or the other, we kind of tried to stagger them. If we had a major telephone construction rebuild going on one summer, we tried to slide the major electric that we were going to do next to the next summer. So, so we, you know, it was it was just pretty hard to, to um, keep track of both in that sense. If you got construction projects going on in both in the summertime, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. get crews out burying cable and putting in telephone equipment, and if you had somebody building substations at the same time. It was, you know, a day-by-day basis. You were trying to s- switch how you thought about things. Mm-hmm. So, and they were, they were, you know, they were different businesses, each with their own problems, each with their own, you know, had two separate boards. Uh, gave me an opportunity. Those years, I managed to uh, meet an awful lot of good board members that served in both cooperatives. Over, uh, we were in, we were in six South Dakota counties and one Montana county. So we were, geographically, we were spread a long way. So we were almost 100 miles each direction, you know. Uh, and then later on, we actually bought some telephone properties when, when U.S. West sold. Uh, we bought Lemon and we bought Newell and uh, uh, Nisland and that area down there on both ends. Projects that joined us on each end of our own project. Mm-hmm. So, and that made us even more difficult in terms of uh, distances. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, when when you uh, went on the board there, uh, was was Leroy Shecker the manager? Yeah, Leroy was the manager. Leroy a little bit, because I think I I did get get to know him a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Leroy is the manager. Leroy's in Rapid City now, and he's, he he has remained a close friend of mine. I, uh, I don't, you know, we don't see him often because we don't get down there very yeah. often. But we see him two or three times a year. Uh, he was the manager all the years I was on the board, and I became manager when he retired. Yeah. He retired a couple times, but he retired that time, and then he then he went back to work in the uh, rural electric industry in Montevideo, Minnesota. Uh, mm-hmm. Was he doing the double thing like you were? Yes, doing? he was doing it too. Uh, it was, yeah, uh, and it was it was a busy job then for him, and it, it and it became worse after that when we got in deregulation, and it's probably worse now. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, the telephone industry has just changed so terribly much that. Yeah, is the current manager doing the double? The current thing? manager Jerry Reisenauer is also doing. Uh, they've never, you know, uh, and they haven't had a lot of managers at Grand Electric. I was the fourth. Leroy was the third. I was I was the fourth, and, and uh, Jerry's the fifth. And that's all the managers they've had in almost well over fifty years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you were also active in the the South Dakota Network. You want to talk yeah. About that a little bit? Yeah. You know during. Uh, that period of time following telephone deregulation, uh, we were we were looking at how we could have an organization that would serve our needs as state in more on a more statewide basis, and eventually we built we the companies uh, got together and built a company called South Dakota Network. That company was initially going to provide fiber optics in uh, across, around the state to kind of link everybody together. That was the, the initial plan. And that came to pass, but as as we grew with that, we realized with the new technologies, we needed to have that company do a lot more than that. We needed to have it provide um, fiber loops where you could have traffic flow both ways so you didn't have interruptions, where you could carry large amounts of data, which were from banks and whoever wanted to buy facility circuits. And we talked for a lot of years. We'd never been in that business, and that business had pretty much been reserved in this country for Northwestern Bell. 
they were the big player and they linked a few of the big cities like Aberdeen and Sioux Falls and Rapid City they they had data links and but really they didn't serve any of the towns that the small companies served and when I say small companies when we were looking at a network we wanted to serve as many towns around the state as we could in order to do that we included not only the co-ops but there are a number of municipal towns that have municipal telephone companies and there are a number of independently owned small town uh, networks and we put together kind of a consortium through South Dakota Network and we expanded that network to every town that we could get and, uh, so that the Bisons and uh, Walls and the towns like that had the same level of facilities that the Rap Cities had, where the banks in, in Lemon could be on a network or uh, whatever. And in that process, uh, you know, those things have a tendency, we, we build a lot of facilities. We, uh, as we built facilities, we found there was more and more demand for them, like those things are, and we built more facilities. <laughs> that business has, has uh, over a number of years, went from almost nothing to a pretty good sized business and it's much bigger now than it was four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. It continues to grow. Uh, there have been, South Dakota Network's a pretty major player in South Dakota in, in the telecommunications industry. Mm -hmm. How many communities are served? Uh, I, I'm going to say there's 30 some companies and some of those companies obviously have a lot more than one community. Yeah. And, and some companies are restricted to one community. I. I don't really have much of a feel, probably. Um, I'll bet you that there are 50, 60 small towns in South Dakota that are served. But I don't know if that number's mm -hmm. very accurate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know you've, you've done your most of your managing, or all of it, out here. Do you think there's a big difference in managing a cooperative system out west here than there is in the eastern part of the states? Well, you know... Either north or south Dakota? Uh, I think each part has their own problems. We have, as an example, the problems we have in the western part of the state is, is the sparsity of, of consumers. Okay. You know, we have a huge amount of lines to serve and facilities to serve relatively few consumers and, and which means our investment on a consumer basis is just there's no way not for it not to be higher however you know i don't think we have some of the problems they have we don't have uh, some of the expensive farming areas to to trench across and mm -hmm. the problems you have Building facilities on expensive land, we kind of don't have that. Yeah. It makes building facilities out here easier. Mm -hmm. We had to build more of them, but it makes it easier to build them. Are um, the landowners easier to deal with out here, maybe? Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of experience directly, but mm -hmm. but people tell me they are. Yeah. You know, and they're not as easy to deal with as they were 20 years ago out here either. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 that's something that is is changing to some degree. As, as that generation of people that was very, very happy to get service disappears, mm -hmm. and, and they disappear more and more every year, mm -hmm. then um, the replacement people, what are there, take service more for granted. And, and I'm sure you see that every place in the state, and, and it's probably typical of from state to state as well. Um, during your time both in the, on the board and then managing, did, did you get involved in any of the uh, 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 efforts to combat attacks, particularly on the rural electric system? Of yeah, yeah, we almost, you know, we annually were involved in, in um, the lobbying efforts at, in Washington and the, uh, through our our national trade organization, which is NRECA, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, uh, you know, they kept us involved and we had to be involved because there were years uh, that uh, funding was 
in trouble for on the program. You know, fortunately, we always had um, strong support. I think from our congressmen and senators, or at least, if not always, I generally had very strong support in in these states. They understood how important uh, rural utilities were in this part of the country, and and but. They usually wanted us to help them lobby and the National Trade Organization. I did that. I did that usually on the telephone side and the electric side every year. Uh, we we uh, participated in a lot of their so-called grassroots programs of education and stuff like that as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you and then you retired in. I retired in uh, in two thousand and one mm-hmm. in. Uh, well, I think originally I told the board July one, but but eventually it, it became August one. But I but I retired in the summer of two thousand one. Um, I'd been there as the manager about eighteen years, and I I just uh, felt that I I wanted to have some time. You know, it was a it was a job where you didn't have a lot of time for yourself. Mm-hmm. Or your family, and mm-hmm. you travel a lot with two co-ops and with statewide organizations. I traveled more than I'd like, than I enjoy traveling, and uh, uh, I spent more time out of the office than I'd enjoy. And then when you're back in the office, of course, it was busy because you had the two co-ops. And I, I felt there there's a point in time where it's hard to uh, do justice to both those jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt it was I was ready. You know, we we talked about what the ideal time to retire. And I I was ready. And once you once you come to the, to the uh, feeling you're ready to retire, then you should be. You shouldn't be working if you're ready to retire because then you're you're not going to do the kind of job you should do. Yeah. It, yeah. it you know it had been you know it would, it had been a uh, nah. Not always, but it'd been for much of those eighteen years. It'd been a sixty-hour-a-week job, and, and you know it's a long time to do it. Mm-hmm. Eighteen years, and mm-hmm. between uh, Leroy Sheffrey, we mentioned him. He, you know, I talked. He'd been managed for a little over twenty years. He and uh, between us, he and I had managed those two cooperatives for over forty years, and you know, you put a lot of hours in when you do that. And and you find you reach the point where you say, you know, I want I want to, I want to work a little less. I would, it would be wonderful if you could take a job like that and work part time, do two or three days. I mean, I I could have really enjoyed that. It's not the kind of job you can do justice to by working mm-hmm. two or three days a week. Mm-hmm. So, did you ever and did the, the folks ever think about maybe dividing that position into two manager positions? You know, we went through that study. Uh, I'm sure Leroy probably went through that study. I did a study for the directors, and we talked about that. And we tried to weigh the pros and cons of the advantages to the members uh, and the, the financial advantages of doing it. And it, what it did really, if you really want to simplify it, it gave you an economy of scale in operations that you didn't have otherwise. Mm-hmm. And it lets you do a, a afford to do a better job yep. and so when you when you get down and really crunch it it always came out to where you know this was really it was a unique one we had people come from other parts of the country because there are only about half a dozen uh joint operations in, yeah, the, in the united states none, yeah. probably none in south dakota. and none in south dakota uh and we had uh people Ask us, you know, that we're talked about doing it, and 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 a case or two came and visited us. Uh, we tried to point out to them that there were a lot, of, there were some difficulties when you did, but there were some advantages. And whenever we try to study it, it seemed like the advantages always ended up outweighing the difficulties. And we'd say, well, it still works better for us than than, than separating. And we and and ultimately that would have been a decision of the two boards, uh, if they. I mean, they was certainly would have had the the right to do it, but you know, the two boards uh, we met on on us not a frequent, but a sometimes 
a time or two a year with the two boards and we reviewed joint operations. We reviewed, reviewed joint operation agreements and, and how we were doing things. And, and uh, the two boards had pretty good rapport with each other. And, and uh, when push came to shove, it was still the thing we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So you've, uh, you've had, what, uh, four to five years now of yep. uh, retirement? Be- what are you doing? Are you uh, ranching down south? Yeah, yet, uh, well, the ranch is a, is a family operation. My son's on it. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm involved in it. Uh, when, it. when it's a busy time of year, I go down and help. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the year I don't do much at all on it. Uh, I pretty much, if I do anything on it, I, I do very little machine work. I hardly ever get on a tractor. Mm-hmm. I, I more likely during the summer when uh, they're busy haying, and I'm more likely to check pastures and check water and check cattle and mm-hmm. things like that, which I. You know, which is relatively easy to do. It takes some time, but it's relatively easy to do, and and it's enjoyable to me. So I, mm-hmm. I do that sort of thing. If we are working cattle, I enjoy a great deal riding horseback, and I still ride yeah. when I have the opportunity. Um, um, you know, other than that, um, pretty much I do enough there to keep myself as busy as I want to be. I have a pretty good sized yard and stuff here to take mm-hmm. care of in the summertime and and then I and I haven't had much luck doing it but I try to get out and play a little golf in the summertime mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's hard to even find time to do those things. Yeah. Yeah. Um have you been uh, certainly if you were doing sixty hour weeks it would be kind of hard, but later on were you active in any of the other community organizations? Well a, a little bit but you know uh, we had our church down there, and I belonged to the Lions Club down there. What well, church was that? The Presbyterian Church. Presbyterian? Yeah, and uh, I belonged to the Lions Club down there and the Commercial Club down there, which mm-hmm. are more of the civic organizations. Uh, my schedule prohibited me from doing a lot in those things. Yeah. Didn't spend a lot of time with them. People are fairly understanding that. You, you uh, And I do that a little bit here in town mm-hmm. as well. I... I uh, have kind of gotten involved in uh, in a couple things here in town that are the same way. We have a uh, housing authority board that we set up, and I'm on that. And we and uh, we got involved in the, in the 2007 is Hedinger Centennial, and we're going to have an all schools reunion. So I'm getting involved in that Centennial reunion stuff and uh, things of that nature. Yeah, you know, they all take a little time and. Uh, and you don't, uh, it's surprising. <laughs> yeah, you, you seem like, it seems like it doesn't take that much to keep you busy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As you look back, what, how would you assess the, uh, the impact of the rural electric program on this part of the world? Well, I think it's probably the most uh, single program that with the largest or greatest impact of any I can think about over the years that happened. I mean, it altered the way of life for people. The rural telephone program offered great conveniences and mm-hmm. also, but it didn't offer quite the, the altering of the way of life that electricity did. Even now there's like rural water programs and, and, and they're progressive and, and I'm really supportive of those. But the one that altered life the most was the rural electric program mm-hmm. in in this country. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, as you say, the, the telephones have had sure. an impact. But, Certainly have had, uh, and the and and uh, rural water is a great new convenience, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, all those things. It's just a matter of if you want to be progressive and. Uh, with those new projects, or do you want to decide you don't need them? You know, and fortunately, most of the people in this country have been really supportive of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the challenges facing uh, the cooperative system have changed over the years. What do you think is the biggest change? 
Well, you know, I, I, uh, one of the one of the really large changes now is uh, it's going to be it's going to be increasingly difficult uh, for loan guarantees from the federal government. Uh, there's hasn't there haven't been grants for a long time, but there have been loans, and and those certain amount of those loans were guaranteed, and you know, with the present budget constraints I think all programs like that are under fire and there's a continuing need to update in infrastructure you know you could put facilities up they don't last forever they they have to be rebuilt they have to be built heavier or better or serve more people uh, I don't care whether that's telephone or electric or what they are uh, they they have you have to have capital to keep adding to those, and uh, so I think capital needs are, are high on the list. The the, the other thing is um, it's becoming more and more. I'm not going to say problem, but more and more of a concern is as as everybody has disappeared that worked hard to build those systems. As those people disappear, uh, it's hard to get the people that are using them now. To understand how important their participation is, mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, you, you you can tell people, and uh, but it's they do take it to some degree for granted, and and you're going to need a lot of support from the members. You have going to large capital needs. I think those two, particularly those two, technically, you know. It's not rocket science anymore. Technically, we can do all the things in those industries uh, that we need to do, and even even in the complex industry like the telecommunications industry, the technology exists to do wonderful things. You know, mm -hmm. can we bring them to the people in a manner that they can afford them in in this part of the country where there aren't a lot of people? Yeah. That's the problem. Where do we get the capital to do it? Uh, and and um, we're going to have to have a lot of participation, getting good board members, put young people interested in being the board members. That's, the boards are going to change. Uh, as the board members get to be a certain age, they're going to want to get off. And a, a really good friend of mine retired this year from the Grand Electric Board. Uh, he, he and I served either on the board or him on the board and me as manager for almost 30 years together. Uh, I, I know he simply says it's you know it's time for me to get off. Somebody else needs to do it, and he's right. You know, I, I uh, when I was getting ready to retire, he was thinking about getting off the board, and I kept telling him, "I want you, I want you to run one more year, one more term. I don't want him to have because he was the board president. I said I don't want to have a new manager and a new board president at the same time. Mm -hmm. And and so he he stayed on the board for a couple more terms. Yep. But he told me now he says you know now it's time for me to get off. They need some, some other, some young person with some new thinking, and uh, and of course, he, I don't know if they needed that. I think he was still doing a good job, but he probably needs a chance to do something else too. Mm -hmm. You think cooperative education is important? You were talking about the fact that people you don't understand the the importance of what was built before. Yeah, yeah I think it's I think it's really important, Chuck. Uh, I, I I think there has never been enough emphasis on it. You know, we don't really have anything in the schools to speak of, uh, of, of the importance of, of the exact question you asked me, the importance of the co-op movements in particularly our part of the country, how, how much they have changed living conditions in, in this area. Uh, I need. I think we need more education. I I know there. You know there are a lot of attempts to have youth tours and and Washington tours and tell at least a limited number of kids those things. I'd I'd like to see there be more education about the co-op movement and in, in in the I'm going to call it the Midwest and the, you know it's probably not that different in other parts of the country, but I'm more familiar with it here. But I'd like to see more information uh, available in the schools and I don't know uh, that's always been um, kind of a nut tough nut to crack mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You, you're, you've been, over the years, been involved with a lot of that stuff. Yeah. And, and it's always been kind of a hard area to get a lot of attention on. Mm-hmm. But I think it's important. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have this generation that uh, grows up and uh, takes over as board members and, uh, that aren't really going to understand how this all came about. I I th- I think I already see that, not at Grand Electric, but I already see it in some local co-ops in this area where uh, I don't really think the board thinks like co-ops anymore. Mm-hmm. You know they 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 get they're so they're caught up in uh, the economics of of it and uh, and, maybe- and forget maybe what the purpose of the co-op was in the beginning. Yeah, I've talked to some people who are concerned that perhaps there's not enough emphasis on services. Yeah, there, should be. there really isn't. Uh, I see it. At, I see it at the, at the local uh, Sandics. Um There's not the emphasis on service that I would like to see there. There's not the emphasis on providing services to the members. Mm-hmm. You know, there's more interest in can we make a little money with a convenience store? Yeah. And and uh, you know, I hate to be overly critical of of those things because that's how the world has kind of changed but at the same time that you're worried about the store then maybe you quit doing some of the other services that your farmers and ranchers really need because they're somewhat Mm -hmm. marginal in terms of of profit centers Mm -hmm. so when you start dividing a business into profit centers and you start saying well this piece over here is making us money and it's a convenience store but this piece over here, which is maybe our shop and oil changes and that stuff, isn't making us money. We should kind of quit doing that one. And pretty soon, all you got is a convenience store. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that bothers me. Yeah, I, I, and I see it. I, it. It isn't unique to this town. Mm-hmm. I, I, I bet you see it all over the state. Yep. 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 And of course, I was just talking to a long time yesterday with Elmo Kane. Elm- he's very frustrated. I'll bet you that Adam frustrates Adam. Elmo a great deal because that's exactly what he was in the elevator area. Yeah. And I see it down here at an elevator, same way. Yeah, yeah. He believed deeply in service. Yeah. He just stressed that. I think, I think, you know, that early generation. And he was it's, mentored by John Reedy. He was he, also. He yeah, and first he, for John over at Yeah, Box. and so, uh, you know, if you were mentored by John, you better have believed in service. You know, I can't imagine that you wouldn't have because you understood because he never missed an opportunity to remind people that service was what it was all about. You know, if you can't, if you're not doing something that the member, I always thought, number one, the member, it has to be a product that the member needs or has a desire for. Number two, you need to be providing that service in in a you know in the most efficient cost effective way you can obviously it's it's a that's a business part of it and and you just you know there aren't a lot of principles involved there go out do a good job for your members is about it yeah. it's not it's not rocket science but mm-hmm. in order to do it you got to provide service yeah. it's just it's there in 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 everything you do uh Somebody walks in the door, you better remember, if you're not there to serve the members, we don't have any business, we don't have any reason to have a business. And that's uh, probably what Elmo feels. Mm-hmm. And that's probably, probably both got it from John Reedy. Yeah. Um, how important do you think uh, uh, cooperation between cooperatives is? I think there's probably been more of it maybe in the area of the rural electrics and rural telephone co-ops and there maybe has been in other areas where where cooperatives tend to uh, at least on the edges of their territories compete with each other yeah uh, well you know like the telephone is, is 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 an example where some of the services you provide like we got those services provided through South Dakota network because there was a need for us to to all put together a network together so that we could get across those property lines. There's not quite the same need if you're talking about um, 
couple of elevators in towns that are 40 miles apart because people can kind of go whichever way they want to and and they don't you know they probably have some things they could do jointly in terms of buying and and selling that Mm-hmm. that would be more efficient and I, and you've seen some of that with the big grain terminals mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know we at one time it wasn't so terribly many years ago when they had 26 train cars to haul wheat and then there were 50 some and then pretty soon there were 100 and some mm-hmm. um, and you know so there's a there's a they've become fewer and fewer of those terminals yep. so they're and in some of those cases, some of those terminals have bought another terminal. So there's mm-hmm. been some joining of properties. Yeah. But not so much that they were cooperating between them, and more or less one of them acquiring the other one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the rural uh, electrics have, have a lot of need for joint cooperation in storm repairs and things of this nature. Mm-hmm. Common, of common this and we had a huge, huge storm down here this year. The worst we've traditionally had a lot of storms in western South Dakota and we got a lot of lines so there's a lot of exposure and we had a lot of times that we you know had significant pole losses this year this year they had a huge loss I think they ended up with 17 or 1800 poles and so they uh, relied a great deal then on trading of crews with other places and other people coming in to help mm-hmm. you and things like and there's a pretty good program in the South Dakota Rural Electric for that mm-hmm. pretty you had some crews going down and we had crews yeah too. clear all over the country you know and they do that nationwide and statewide and that's been that's been an excellent uh, program it helps it's it's a way to help those that have suffered that damage immediately and, and sometimes you're going to be the one or somebody else is going to be the one mm-hmm. so there's been more of that in, in the electric I think and and that and, and and telephone maybe then the other co-ops, and I haven't seen as much as what you see in the in the elevators, and I suppose in the oil companies to some degree is is some joining, or some buying out others. Mm-hmm. And, you know they operate this uh, local, Senex is now called Alliance Ag Cooperative yeah. I think, and it's Regent and Hedinger in New England. Mm-hmm. So you see some of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's some also some uh, getting together in the area of providing fertilizer. Right, do more, do more, you know, and and maybe there are some advantages for their abilities to purchase. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What sort of advice would you give someone today who uh, was interested in either ranching or going to work for a cooperative, <laughs> or serving on a cooperative board? Any of those things. Well. Uh, you know, I told my son, who's on the Rural Water Board, which isn't quite the same as the Cooperative Board, but it's it's a new board with that's putting in new infrastructure. Uh, and he, he I, I keep telling him, you know, take the time to serve on the board. It's important that members serve and members understand what's going on. So I guess... As far as, as as far as serving on the board, I think the critical thing is it takes some time. It requires some sacrifice by the individual. You're going to go to some meetings when you're tired and wish maybe you didn't need to go to that meeting. But it, unless you have the people, the young people in particular I'm talking now, that are willing to do that, you're going to lose in the end you're going to lose some of that co-op philosophy so you need to to retain the co-op philosophy you need to have young board members serve and understand it mm-hmm. as far as ranching <laughs> you know ranching and farming i think and if you're not doing it in a in a family setting where the family setting provides you an opportunity and a little bit of sometimes a little bit of safety net mm-hmm. It's a, it's a, it'd be a terribly difficult thing for anybody to get into other than that. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. just, it's so capital intensive. Yeah, just uh, a huge difference from the early. Oh years yeah. When the first folks came out. Yeah. It was the easiest thing to get into then. It was the easiest thing to get, but now, it, you know, now I can't quite imagine some young guy 
saying, okay, I want, I want a ranch. What do I have to do? Well, I have to go buy myself four or 5,000 acres of land. Mm -hmm. I have to buy myself a line of machinery to hay with and to feed cattle with. I've got to buy myself a herd of cattle. And going in and telling the banker that and having the banker say, Oh yeah, that's no problem. We we'll just line up we we'll just line up a couple million dollars worth of financing for you to do it. It it's a it, it's a difficult, really difficult thing for young farmers to get into. You know, and there's been attempts at some state to have young farmer programs where they where they uh had some financing programs and things of this nature and I think those things help, but Mm -hmm. it, it's it's just a terribly difficult thing and then <clears throat> once you're in it you have to want to be in it bad enough so that you are willing to probably make less money than you could and have a and have not necessarily as good a lifestyle you, you mean you got the lifestyle you want but you're probably going to do with less material things and make the sacrifices if you're going to make it work then the young couple that both move to Sioux Falls or mm -hmm. or Fargo and just get jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's yeah. it's uh you know, on a short term basis, oh they got they got uh, a health program, they probably got a retirement program, uh they got free time uh, mm -hmm. on their weekends and they get vacations. Um uh, mm -hmm. Ranchers look at that. You better want to love to ranch, or you're not going to. And not only you better love to ranch, your wife better like it too, mm -hmm. or you're, not, or it's going to be tough going. Mm -hmm. Would you describe yourself as an optimist or a pessimist? Well, I think I'm an optimist. optimist. Yeah. yeah. Now, is there anything else you'd like to to, to say? It's something that I didn't we didn't get into so far. Oh. Uh, You know, uh, no, not really. You know, I, I was going to mention too. Like, I was, I was really, uh, I was really pleased last year when I was inducted into the South Dakota Hall of Fame. I, it was not a thing that I ever thought about mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, and I looked at that and I thought, you know, I was, I was really pleased, and I, and I, I felt like it was a, it was an honor. I wasn't sure. Why it was an honor necessarily that I was more eligible before? There's a, there's a lot of people that have worked in the field and spent a lot of energy and a lot of years in it. Maybe they all should be in the South Dakota Hall of Fame. You know, uh, it's hard to pick some individuals out and say this person is or that person isn't. I, I have a friend that is being nominated this year for South Dakota, Hall of Fame, and they asked me to write a letter, and this guy is. Very, very deserving. It very it was very uh, in the early uh, telecommunications days. He was very active and really was a leader. And he, a lot of the things that he stressed doing on a statewide organization were really important. Uh, I hope he gets. I hope he he's being nominated. I hope he gets elected. But there's, I can look around and I can see all kinds of people that I worked with in the program that the same thing is true with. You know, you could make the case for a lot of people that they did a lot of things for the program. Yeah. And, uh, and while I don't know the people as well, I know that the, the other co-op industries other than telephone and electric are the same way. There's people, people that dedicated their lives to those programs. The Elmo Keynes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. We've been visiting with Daryl Henderson. Thank you for participating in the Cooperative Legacy Project. Thank you. Thank you.